Bam. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome we to are. another episode of IoT Happy Hour. We apologize yeah. that we're two minutes late because we are learning how to click the go live button over here. Yeah. So apologies on that. But uh, I think we're live. I hope we're live. I see comments rolling in, so we should be. <laughs> I'm David. I'm developer advocate here at Bellina. And it's another episode of IoT Happy Hour. As usual, I tried to count them. I think this is number 18, if my math is correct. And two more to go, are, right? We're only doing 20 go. episodes. That's yeah, it. 20, 20 is probably <laughs> about our limit. Yeah. That's, the, uh, that's a, the Netflix buy, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's season two. Then that'll be season two after that. Yeah, we'll take a hiatus and come back uh, in the fall. Um, I'm joined today by a special guest, Frederick from APIC.ai who I'm gonna introduce in just a moment, but first I wanna go around the room to our regular attendees who can give a quick hello so we can devote more time to Frederick for a full intro. So Andrew, you wanna say hi? Yeah, hey, I'm Andrew Nem. Uh, I am VISC jockeying today uh, on the happy hour. That means uh, doing all the video things, so hopefully I don't confuse anyone. But yeah, other than that, <laughs> running the content. Stuff. Oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> Doing the content stuff at Belena, uh, helping everyone produce their projects and making sure that the world knows about them and we can all hang out like this. All right. John, you're up. Say hello. Hi. I'm John Tonello. I'm technical marketing lead here at Belena. And Andrew, it's it's too late. You know, you, you've already, you know, mm -hmm. but spun the spun the dial on VJing, so Oh, that's <laughs> fine. That, that, that's what's cool now. It's like unabashed, just raw candidness. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> All right, Mark, you're up. Say hello. Hey, this is Mark, developer advocate at Valina, like David, based in Europe. Uh, this week, I have been push uh, the Laura Gateway. We talked last episode, and um, yeah, ready to know more about these. Yeah, I am excited to learn about them as well. Frederick, why don't you go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Hi, I'm, I'm the honor. Yeah, <laughs> really That's nice to be here. Really cool. Uh, so my name is Frederick, and I'm the co-founder and CTO at uh, Epic AI. Um, what we try to do is we try to save bees with artificial intelligence. So um, therefore, we build kind of a hive monitoring system that's just observing bees and trying to figure out how their behavior is changing, and therefore. Um, deduce if something in the environment is wrong or uh, if there have been other influencing factors in the bees. And um, yeah, should I go on and like just give a quick overview about Epic AI, what we're doing? Um, well, you can do the 10 second version. Ready? Okay. Yeah, if you want to give a 10 second version, absolutely. 10, but I've got some intro nine. questions before we dive. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, uh, as mentioned before, like what we're doing is uh, figuring out like how bees are uh, are moving through the field of view uh, in uh, of our camera in front of the beehive, and we detect something like, for example, if they bring food inside or not. And the the simple like naive approach is if they don't bring food into the hive, there's a lack of food supply in the surroundings, and that's where we involve like local governments and so on to tell them what they need to do in order to improve the life of every uh, pollination insect, not only bees, but all of them in the environment. That's that super cool. Legit. <laughs> that is incredible. That legit. Um, I can't wait to dive into this. But before we do that, we've absolutely got to get to our what's on your desk segment. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> now, what's on your desk? What's on your desk? <laughs> Is that, this is why we need Chris on the streams right. because Aww. I'm just I'm just not sure it's the same. You don't like him. the metal version? Uh, it it was different. It was different. I'm not entirely sure that I loved it, but oh, maybe it'll okay. maybe it'll grow on me. We'll we'll see. Right on. Um, so. I will go first if I can figure out how to change my camera. I did it earlier, but now let's see if I can do it again. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. If you saw on Twitter yesterday, I had sent out a, uh, a request for projects to see what people are hacking on. So I have an Intel Movidius NCS stick. That's actually an NCS one right there. And I now notice that it's upside down. Oops, sorry about that. 
Um, and I am doing some hacking with uh, the Always AI containers that we featured a couple of weeks back um, when Jason was on the show. Um, so I've got those up and running. I was hoping to show off a dog detector today, but <laughs> unfortunately my dog is not cooperating. So we do not have a dog detector. Well, actually, let me see if I can do a quick screen share over to here. Let me do, let me have a moment um, to get that. And if someone else wants to go, Mark, I know you had something. So yeah, I actually I was uh, cleaning some boxes and I found this. I don't, know if, uh, I don't know. I don't have two cameras, sorry. <laughs> like a hanger, <laughs> like you can find in your wardrobe. But actually, yeah, this is a really cool one with an NFC detector, and we have an ESP8266 inside with another ESP something with Bluetooth. So we have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and we have some LEDs here and here with a battery and a charger for a battery. And actually, a button to turn on and turn off. It's not very polished yet, but actually, this was to detect pieces of clothing in yeah in a shop or in a wardrobe. And actually, cool. it's working. Actually, if we turn it on, we can yeah. see the LEDs. And actually, we had a, like a dashboard where you can click a search a specific uh, piece of clothes, and then it was like blinking with another colors. So pretty cool to find. Project like these and remember crazy. I, I have an important question for you, Mark. I'm sure. going to represent all the RGB LED aficionados out there. Can you customize the RGBs, the LEDs, colors? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Full spectrum. But <laughs> yeah, this is pattern a... blinking? Can we get some pattern blinking going? Yeah, but uh, but this is a project from five years ago. So I'm not no. sure uh, I still have the code, but I'm sure that we can do something for you. Chris isn't on this week, but I know he's like immediately looking over to his desk, looking at his fade candy board, thinking, hmm, it can be done. <laughs> I'm sure. And probably Alan saying, yeah, if Chris does it, no, I can do it as well. How's your dog detector, David? Well, there's no dogs in the view. There's... Can we draw a dog? Like how... uh, yeah, uh, there's no dog there. Uh, <laughs> just uh, just the... Just here, a boy. hand moving around. So normally Buddy. he, yeah, normally he sets up shop here under the desk. Yeah. So I got my dog detector running, but uh, oh, what's it saying? Bird. Bird. Sixty percent of bird. Sixty percent of bird. Well, <laughs> he is not cooperating today. Apologies. We have a ship. Yeah, yeah. If you if you keep doing that, Jason's gonna Jason Ku's gonna hop on and yell at yeah. us. He is. I know. I know. We're we're teasing him. It actually, <laughs> it's funny because I I tease, but the other ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it actually works great. <laughs> so, all right. Anybody else got anything? Frederick, I have yep. a strange feeling that you have some pretty yep. neat stuff on your desk. Yeah, if one one thing uh, that's not on my desk, but I still want to show you. But one of the most important things I, I'm I'm really happy about it is uh, what we discovered. So we have a bunch of micro SD cards in the office, like the bunch, like oh my. I think by now 256 <laughs> or something. And keeping track of them is is hard. So what I discovered is like having like this coin collectors uh, sheets. It's very useful to keep micro SD cards, label them, and don't have them lying around. And uh, wow. most important brilliant. in our office, like having labels micro SD cards. Um, that's and the other, other thing that's not in our office, but I still want to, uh, not in, on my desk, but I still wanted to show you is uh, one cool thing we built for our office that's called, we called it Hodor. So uh, Hodor is opening our doors <laughs> and it's basically connected to our doorbell. <laughs> Let's see where it is. Uh, somewhere there, there's just a Raspberry Pi that has a GPIO that's connected to the doorbell. And if, if it rings, uh, a Slack alert will going on, and we can just open the door by mentioning, oh, door, please open the door. Or oh, some my. Other oh. Nice. All right, help. that deserves this. That's an amazing machine. Yeah, wow. Um, so actually, <clears throat> not every employee has like a key. So like, <laughs> this was an expanded having, like, version of what's on my desk, right? 
Yeah. I mean, that's what's in the office. Um, <laughs> that's incredible. I, I totally thought it's he was going to shove his webcam like into the apiary or something. Like, because literally, yeah. when you're working with bees, like the outdoors is your desk, right? More or yeah, less. Now, they well, wait a minute. Business. I have a follow up question there, though. That's your office? Hold on a minute. Can you spin the camera? What? Lucky guy. Yeah, wait a minute. What an incredible office. Whoa. What? Oh, man. Yeah, Big really hardware. Hashtag How? hardwood. What's what's the hashtag that we got going on for Hold appreciating on hardwood? How did you construct that? What is that thing? So these are like two old shipping containers. So we've been uh, luckily to be part of um, of kind of a scholarship situation where we got uh, access to this this all to the old shipping containers that have been modified to be an office, like with a bathroom inside, kitchen, and so on. And it's really cool. And especially right now in these difficult times, the most important uh, important part is working outdoors. And we are really happy um, to have like this cool space over here, like just sitting Dang. and working like a few meters apart of everybody and uh, in the fresh air. And it's really cool. Really enjoy it, especially in the nice weather right now. Even though That's it's awesome. Little, but, yeah, cool. yeah. Wow. Nice. That Man, is... I don't want Incredible. Yeah. I'm jealous. Okay. I don't, I need to I don't want to go after that. Yeah. I don't want to uh -huh. go after that. <laughs> <laughs> I know he just won the, he yeah. just absolutely won what's on your desk. <laughs> yeah, but, but maybe let's, it's not on, on our desk anymore, but uh, like we, we needed to supply one beehive that's far away with internet connect with some internet connection. And Can you say that sentence one more time? I mean, you literally right. just said we're gonna give a beehive. Okay, we, we had a beehive that's somewhere remote, and we don't have a strong internet connection there. So we've been wondering. You don't like, hear that every day. Yeah, how well, awesome. oh, can we get internet there? Uh, and so we decided to buy like this ubiqu ubiquity um, peer-to-peer like Wi-Fi extension things. That's like twenty kilometers can can range for 20, 20 kilometers. Now you can see it up there. So there's like wow. a big. Big antenna going to our beehives and supplying them with some nice Wi-Fi. Oh, so we can test our Balena updates and uh, update the containers a little faster than on mobile. That needs a clear link, right? Like a, in a past yeah. lifetime, I worked for a company that used a lot of ubiquity gear, and it's just that stuff is so fascinating. Like it, you have to have another receiver right on the other end, and the line must be yeah, like clear. Any, any interruption. For the image, because it's like next to the beehive, it's larger than the beehive. The antenna itself looks very, very fresh. So like, there's something poetic um, about it, because usually in that line of work, people complain that bees will often build or wasps will build nests around the antenna. But in this case, you're like, that's oh, chill. Yeah, that's actually it. great <laughs> in this particular case. So. It. Um, I mean, I have already so many questions just based on the brief introduction you've given, Frederick. So um, I think it's probably a good idea to transition unless, hold on, wait a minute. John, did you have anything you want to show? Or Andrew, I don't know if you can follow that up. I, I got to be honest. I'm uh, trying to show, I live in, in Baldwinsville, New York, and our school is the Baldwinsville Bees. <laughs> There you I go. Right just on. thought I'd throw that in there. Um, Thank you. Thank you for that. These, these hardcore bees. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. That's amazing. I have a couple, I have fins on Belina fins on my desk, but we can say that for next week because that was legit. That whole that we, we're in a very natural feel right now. We got a lot yeah. of welcome around the bee project, but let's let's keep it. Keep All right, it we'll save the fin unboxing for next week. Um, so moving along then, like I said, I have got a ton of questions. The very first one though, is I saw attack of the bees recently. Are you sure Frederick that we're supposed to be saving these, these bees? Are you, are you positive? I mean, I also saw attack of the birds, attack of the killer tomatoes. I mean, I saw all of them, but I, I'm not convinced that we should save the bees. Are you sure about this? We we are really really confident that like for us it's or it's one of the bigger challenges that we're facing is that bees or not only bees like honeybees but all the insects that are pollinating uh, we need to provide them with a healthy environment to to stay alive because otherwise we don't get food um, especially if you're looking for example in, in the United States where the almonds are blossoming 
they are like a bunch of beehives are, are brought to California just to pollinate, and that's like just a bad sign if we as humans need to 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 tra uh, trans travel with bees like for for hundreds of miles to another place just to get pollination and get almonds or something else to eat. Um, before we are very dependent uh, on them and. Um, like they're very nice. If you don't harm them, uh, they they're very nice and they don't sting you. Uh, even though, like sometimes, like when I'm next to the beehive and it's really hot weather, they are kind of in a, a strange mood sometimes. Then you need to be careful. But it's same with with our students. If we are like in a hot box in the summer uh, and we staying inside for hours with like 40 degrees, it's, it's not that nice and we get angry and and sting other That's people. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. All I, right, David. I actually me. used to feel the same way when I was growing up. I wasn't a big fan, uh, mainly because I'm aller slightly allergic to them. But uh, in my adult years, we wow, nice work, John. <laughs> um, Frederick, you probably have a lot to say about this. But at our at our at our property here, we have a lot of pollinating pollinating plants. We're actually trying to get certified as like a whatever environmentally friendly habitat. I don't remember what the actual Oregon thing is. But anyway, you see them working and it's so fascinating. They go from the front yard to the backyard and like, they don't care that you're there, right? Like when I was growing up, it's like, oh, bee. but if you like get to know them and understand what they're all about, they literally just like doing work and it's, it's cool. I dig it. And I, you know, I did read something recently about uh, a company that was making artificial bees um, Whoa. that were Oops, able to pollinate. Um, which was <laughs> that wasn't me about that. But, that was not me. Uh, <laughs> which is fascinating too, because you know, in places where bees are threatened, um, that's a, a critical capability. Like the most important thing, or like what we what we should be careful is we have regions on the earth where there's not enough pollination, and we need to support it uh, with like keep doing like it artificially or whatever, bringing bees some somewhere else. Um, but we should be like a little bit, little bit more aware, like about the situation, um, so that other regions are not uh, dipping over this point where we need to supply artificial pollination by just bringing other bees there or whatever. Um, so, like providing like food for all of the insects in the region, especially in 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 times of the year right now where there is not a lot of blossoming, um, it's really helpful uh, and supportive. And like sometimes you see, for example, I'm very um, I saw like a stranded bumblebee on my on my balcony last last week, and just give it some sugar water, and it was flying away, uh, just supporting them. Sometimes, <laughs> what a fun! No, nah, that is that is awesome. All right, I'm convinced. I am, of course, teasing. I like I said in the in the intro, I'm actually a really big fan of the work, and I am a big advocate and friend to the bees as well. So, although I can't say I've uh, taken it quite as far as you but I certainly uh, try to do my part. So I think um, it's probably a good uh, time to transition to really take a deep dive here into what you are up to over there. So you wanna start us off, I think maybe a little bit of your background, your team, sort of you know where you're based out of. I think we heard a little, of course, about the mission and goals already, but if there's anything you wanna add there, um, give us the uh, give us the high level overview. I think you might have had some slides as well. If if you think that's easier to um, to tell the story, um, yeah. Well, I will use them just briefly uh, the slides, but it would be cool mm -hmm. if you can bring it up. Um, so, like our main goal is is like to uh, conserve uh, biological diversity. So we think that technology by now just en enables us to collect like a bunch of data information that's all around us and it helps us to better understand how the environment is changing and um, therefore we want to to enable other people to with by giving them the information to make more uh, educated decisions so like one of the main thing that's driving us is that um, the lack of knowledge shouldn't be the reason why bad stuff is happening and um, we like in the past we tried a lot of things, but by now we figured out that there were basically like, two things where we can support uh, support it or change something. And that's one thing where we just collect a bunch of data. In for example, it's uh, right now in the the city of Karlsruhe in Germany, where we based. We have a pilot program with 
um, where we closely work with companies, local companies and the local government to figure out where a certain region that needs to uh, have other plants uh, being planted there uh, to support the bees a little more or um, to have uh, food supply for all pollination in insects in the whole time. And the other thing is, um, is we now doing some ecotoxical studies. So right now there, there's, there's, it's not so clear what are all the reasons that are um, behind the decline of bees all around the world. But one factor that's quite often um, gets picked up there is like that, for example, pesticides are a bad thing. Uh, and we just want to supply um, the the uh, authorities with information about like these substances, how they're changing, or what what the impact is. And that's the other thing what we're doing. We are doing tests and see what kind of impact have a certain substance on the behavior of bees, and therefore uh, just get a better understanding and supply us with the with all the information that that we need in order to make a good decision if certain substance should get onto the market or not. So if it's harmful or not, uh, and therefore the lack of knowledge shouldn't be the reason like why all the bees or all the insects that we are dependent on as humans uh, are dying. Um, yeah. So that's that's like the whole mission and and story behind us and how it how it's get started. So we founded a company with like three people. It's uh, Matthias, Katrina, and me. And Matthias is like the hardware guy. He's doing his PhD in uh, distributed sensor networks at the uh, research center for computer science next door. And like he's like he does some crazy, crazy things with with electronics. And um, we like that. Really yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. That's our type. <laughs> <laughs> like, for well, example, I would right? argue. I would argue that you do also. You know, last uh, last year, by the end of December. We uh, opened up the the camera sensor of the Raspberry Pi camera because we wanted to see like if a certain pin on the chip itself is connected and so on and um, like soldering on these like tiny things it's very hard and he's um, yeah really good at this and for other things like he's collecting CNC mills and so on really cool guy uh, and Katrina on the other side um, has a lot of bee knowledge so she's a beekeeper herself and. Um, studied uh, international management, therefore like the whole business stuff around it. And um, I myself have a lot of experience in machine learning, computer vision, and um, that's where like all, the whole idea started. Um, like figuring out if you can observe bees to see, for example, how many go into the hive, how many leave, and therefore determine if there's, for example, a change in behavior or a lot of bees are, are just don't returning. And um, that's like how all of this got started. Um, let's see if I have like a few nice pictures to show about this. Um, that's what I already covered. So like the, the, the whole thing, what, we, what we're doing or what we try to do is um, first, what I mentioned before, see just in, in, in the field of view of the, of the beehive, how many bees go inside the, and outside the hive. And therefore, we have some some hardware sitting next to the beehive uh, that's running like an NVIDIA Jetson um, that just yeah using the Raspberry Pi camera to see how many bees go go in and out. So detecting it first, do the tracking later, and therefore just counting. And then there we have further steps that are very very helpful for us to figure out. For example, if they bring pollen to so food inside, you can see on the legs of the bee that there is like this 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 orange thingy. And um, that's just pollen, and we can that as humans we can visually identify that it's there, and we can train a machine to do it too, and therefore just count uh, how many uh, pollen gets brought into the hive, and if there's, for example, a lack of pollen supply in a certain um, part of the month, and then it's very helpful, or easy for for the government to say, hey, in this month there's there's a lack of food supply, and uh, we should change something. Quick question um, there, if you have yeah. the moment. Um, yeah, sure. Not, along with like food and pollen, um, and let me know if you're going to cover this later in your slides too. Um, are there any like illnesses that bees have that that can be picked up visually that can be learned? So we we started with the idea to, for example, go with the like there's this varroa mite, like a, a small mite that's um, that's very in Europe very difficult for a lot of uh, of beekeepers. Um, because it's it's killing a lot of beehives and it's mm. very harmful. 
and it's like a red dot and that's something where we started to de wanted to detect it and um, yeah, enable the beekeeper for example seeing like if his hive is infected or not but the main challenge that is if you want to figure out like detect this red dot and you see it on the flying bees it's way too late because then your whole hive is infected therefore oh, wow. like sometimes it's not 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 as easy or not as helpful for the uh, for the beekeeper to, to have this information uh, because you get it quite late um, what we figured out by now is that we we understand the bee itself as more kind of a biosensor so sensor that's flying around and collecting data for us therefore we not we we not only help in the beekeeper itself uh, whose beehives we observing but moreover the whole like surroundings we see like bees going everywhere what's what's growing everywhere and so on and that's like the information that we try to gather and you can see on the like uh, on the the last part on the bottom that pollen might have different or they have different colors so different plants have different colors associated with them and therefore um, if we see a wide range of colors this gives an indication how diverse is the environment like if we see like 10 colors then that means that there's a lot of different plants blossoming if we only see one there's a dominant one one thing that's blossoming and it might be helpful to more diversify it um, because there are also insects that are like all the wild bees that are very dependent on one special plant or one kind of, of type of food and having like diverse food supply is very helpful. Um, so going away from like these monocultures to just supply them with all the food that, that they need. Um, yeah, so this, these are like the, the steps around it. Sure. I mean, you don't want to eat the exact same thing every day either. So. Right. <laughs> you want the same exact thing for dinner every single day of your life? Mm, probably not. So that makes sense. Yeah. In a few days, it might be fun, but afterwards, <laughs> it's, it's boring. And yeah. that's how bees sometimes feel in like these monocultures. Like you get, for example, one one kind of of um, of, of plant every day of the year because there's a big agriculture field. And then after it has blossoming, there's nothing there. There's like a um, a green valley, or I'm not sure like what's the right translation is from from the German term that we're using is like there's there's the, it's green itself, but there's nothing nothing blossoming anymore anymore because like, it's just one plant, the whole like surrounding, and uh, that's where it gets started that there's not uh, no natural pollination anymore because all the insects are dying from there. They don't have anything to eat for for autumn or uh, spring. What is the English word for that? Is it unfertile, non-fertile, barren, barren? Um, yeah, I, don't I mean, know. the only other thing I can think of is, yeah, if you're in a uh, in an area where all the flowers bloom at one time, and then, you know, okay, great, you have a month of all the flowers blooming, but the other 11 months of the year you have nothing, then, yeah, what do the bees do in that scenario? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, don't I mean, know. it's a bit, it's it's a, it's a lot of nice food for this small period of time, and they're very happy in this point of time. But afterwards, it's kind of hard for bees. They 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 just they they build like up their their supply in their hive. They might be able to survive it, but other bees like bumblebees or so on, uh, they don't store as much food. Are you able to extrapolate what you're doing with bees to other insects or other species? Yeah. Yeah, we we're using bumblebees. I'm um, not sure. Like we have two bumblebee hives right over there, but you can probably let's 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 test if we could see it. Oh, There's no device to be attached. But are we, really, so, are we really walking over to a, a live? Are you going to a live? Oh, be careful! Be careful! Uh, <laughs> I don't want to get closer, but they're just like bumblebee hives in there. Uh, but bumblebee hives are very like only like few hundred in there, so you need to wait like 50 minutes or 50 uh, minutes to okay. see just one leaving. <laughs> We're, you should do it because we're, we we need to build out our uh, collection of, of of interesting IoT happy hour guest moments. I think one was remember when they drove that robot into the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was and then we can have Frederick here, uh, you know, walking into a beehive. Yeah. Uh, How many times have you been stung, Frederick? I think that's really the question on everyone's mind. <laughs> should we make yeah. it a poll? Like, we'll, let's have people on chat uh, okay. chime in. How, how many yeah. times he's been stung? Well, what, what period of time? Let's take a guess. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's give a scope here, though. So, uh, how long have you been doing this, Frederick? Let's use that as the scope. Well, we, we started, yeah. like, uh, I think with the idea two years ago. and Two years. 
one to one and a half years ago, so August, August, uh, yeah. Almost okay, so a year and a half to two years. Yes. Uh, we'll let the viewers put their guesses into the chat and we'll give them a minute. While and they're rolling in, I'm going to get, get, it was the first time I got stung uh, while working here. So before that, I didn't get stung by any bee. And, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I can imagine. OK, so I'm going to take a guess. I'll say you've been stung. Uh, I'll go 75. I'll wow, that, be that seems guess. high. That's, that's a lot. He'd be he's, not making, he's not making honey. <laughs> It's been a year and a half. I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna go with 25. I'm gonna go with uh, yeah. I'm gonna go with five. Oh, you, you, so it's Chris apparently on yeah. the uh, chat. <laughs> Anish 42. 40. Wow. I, I like that. I like that. Anish. The answer. Yep. The answer. Yeah. Everything. What about because he's, what about you, Mark? He's, because he's studying the behavior, he understands how to avoid oh. you know, bees. When <laughs> that's that is, that is learned. That is learned. I would say in the beginning, he probably got stung quite often until he figured it out. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark, you owe a guess. What are you yeah. thinking? I don't know. Um, so like 25. 25. Was All right. Right on. All right, right Frederick, on. go ahead. Let us know. You know how many times have you been stung? I was thinking about like what, how, my, how often it was. It was, wasn't that often. So. One thing I discovered quite early is that I'm allergic to bees. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. <laughs> um, but it was, I think, five times or seven times, so not lucky. Yeah. Quite wow. Oh, yeah, man. Chris. Chris. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you have, you have at least uh, five EpiPens around? Is that yeah, so I've, I've won and a few other things like uh, Heavily, I, I didn't need to use it, uh, and I'm hopefully I will never need to use it. So I'm okay with yeah. one with one sting, but like after three, I got one time at at, uh, at the same time was a bit dangerous. Yeah, and we all have our bumblebee stories too. You know, like my brother and I were playing as kids and in this vacant lot with oh. overgrown things, and he was playing on this log. And all of a sudden, he started screaming, and he'd stepped over a knot hole in the log, and the bees oh. flew up his pant leg. Oh! And oh. stung the hell out of him. So, real quick, we're at the halfway mark of the show. Yeah. And for yep. folks who have joined, uh, we're definitely this isn't some weird episode where we're just talking about the number of times we've been stung by bees <laughs> or yeah. childhood bee stories. Uh, we actually have Frederick Tausch uh, of Apex AI on talking to us about using Edge AI to study bees. So just in case people in case are joining, were joining late, what are, they, yeah. what are they talking about? Uh, we're on track. We're on track. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Thing. Let's get that slide deck back up. Um, and is that, what's that picture right there? Is that one of the devices at the entrance to the hive right yes. there? Yes, it is. So, uh, this was a study we did last year and we did a few scientific publication on it where we tested the substance that, uh, like a neonicotinoid, so like a new, new pesticide that was used or that is basically a nicotine or new version of it. And it's kind of a drug. And what um, it's now forbidden in a lot of, 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 of countries by now, because we just people discovered that um, it has an impact on the orientation sense of, of bees itself. And uh, on this picture, you can see a lot of different methods. How, for example, the the loss of bees was detected currently. For example, on the on the bottom part, you can see like this mesh, and uh, people have been just tracking how many dead bees are inside this mesh and using it as an indicator if it's harmful or not. And sadly, if bees don't return or use, um, lose their sense of orientation, you will never find it in there. And um, there are a lot of reasons why this substance has been allowed, but by now it's pretty, pretty clear that it's harmful and a lot of countries uh, don't allow to use it anymore and we just did a test to see if we can detect it too like with the like a test substance or like where we know what the impact is and the device itself uh, that you can see in front of the hive is is basically our camera so we completely close the entrance of the hive and um, force every bee to walk through our field of view of the camera 
So we see everything that's going into the hive and moving out of the hive. Um, and therefore, it's just an edge deploy computer with some solar cells next to it and some mobile connection um, that does most of the magic. I was going to ask about that. And I don't know if it's something you want to say for later or you have any um, deeper dive into. But yeah, so what exactly is in there and how does that work? You just mentioned cellular. So it's a, uh, I think you had said earlier it was a Jetson Nano. Yeah, and so we have. No, go ahead. Go ahead. One part that's, that's on my desk most of the times it's uh, Jetson Nano with a custom sync. Um, three mil. Uh, so we use just the Jetson Nano when we have Balena on, uh, installed on it, uh, and we we modified the the driver a bit to work better with the camera and so on. Because in the last year we we started with the Raspberry Pi and now we moved on to the Jetson Nano since it has way more computing power and it's way better for doing a lot of the numerical computation that um, that neural networks are doing uh, within the GPU uh, and the CUDA GPU that's supplied by NVIDIA. Um, therefore, um, yeah, we, we're using it there. And we have some external antenna, so just um, for LTE or GSM connection to, to send some information to us back and by updates that we're doing on the field. Um, yeah, so that's how many, that's how many devices do you have? That you manage this way. So we, we deployed Open Balena, so we deployed it ourselves. And in the database by now, I think we are up to ID like 250 or something, even though like there are a lot of wow. development devices in there that's not uh, not active anymore. We have deployed around, I think, 60 devices by now. Um, so uh, we have, for example, this this project in the city of Karlsruhe that um, that I showed on the slide or could be showing on the slide. We have a lot of of hives deployed all around the city to see like how the the health of the of the environment is changing. And um, these are around forty two devices deployed there, and the rest are for other uh, other um, yes. Yeah. Uh, one quick question: uh, Should we try playing the video? I missed it completely. It's a very cool introduction, like 90 seconds. Um, we can certainly try if you think it will it, work. It. I don't think it's going to pipe the audio in. I'm not sure with Chrome sharing tabs. So yeah. with, with Google Meet, yeah, maybe. You know what? Well, Just what share we the link to the video. I, we'll I, drop I, it oh, in the chat. Yeah. Yep, let's grab the link to it, which I think I have. And we will take that and put it into chat for folks to give a try. Um, I gave it a, I gave it a whirl yesterday, and I did not have great results attempting to play it and stream it at the same time. Um, it just yeah, we're not, we're not there Google. yet. <laughs> yeah. Two folks from from Google has have been visiting us last year in the summer and did a nice. cool like ninety seconds video like what we're doing since we're using TensorFlow, which is just like an open source project, like a project by Google. Uh, and like for a good story and we're very happy that they, they shared our story. Um, and yeah. Yeah, let's share that. This is yeah, that's the actual link. Just go ahead and drop uh, it in the chat. I am looking I to don't, so. it right now. <laughs> Right on, right on. I just need to make sure that this is the right one. How do you manage the electricity on the on the beehives? Because I have yeah, seen we, some solar panels, but I have seen some wires. So how, how do you manage the electricity in the middle of nowhere? Solar panels and a uh, big uh, big power bank. Like the power banks you get like for, for you recharging big uh, yeah, uh, accus, so big batteries in there. Um, and just some sort of custom charging things around it to supply it for like more than 24 hours. And the Jets Nano is quite power hungry. Like for, would, for a small computer, uh, I think it's like, especially since we have like custom lighting and so on, in bad situations, it might be up to 15 watts or 20 watts that it's drawing. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But the the cool thing is that bees are only mostly flying when it's when it's the day, so uh, if it gets especially more in the spring or autumn, 
uh, we can we can shut down the device. Uh, so we have some other like microcontrollers in there. Or some I think it was from Nordic, the NRF something. Yeah, we have some power management in there that just says, "Hey, battery is empty. Uh, I will shut you down and wake you up when we have power again." And that's usually okay. when usually when these start flying again. Yeah, I've seen examples in the past with low power uh, technologies and solar panels, but yeah, not, not that. So just counting the kilos of the beehive, things like that. Yeah. Another yeah, yeah, cool thing oh. we try around is um, there's this like one uncanny. They're really cool. It's I think it was like 15 bucks or so with the display and so on, and it's really cool because it has a risk. I think risk five architecture inside, like a chip with some new network accelerators. It's a really cool thing to try around and play around, and it doesn't draw as much power, but not as cool. as good for our, for for the stuff that we are doing. But a cool thing to to play around, especially for dog detection. Yeah. <laughs> do you look so, at your data in real time? I mean, do you or do you? How do how do how do you consume that data? And, and yeah, I have a similar question because if you're monitoring that beehive, let's say all day long, throughout at least throughout you know the the daylight hours, and that camera is on, are you storing all of that video footage locally there or streaming it all back? Yeah, uh, a lot of ideas that 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 we or what a lot of things that we tried. So <laughs> as a backup, it's always good to have video footage. Like something went wrong, and you still want to see what's happened there, and afterwards you want to have a bigger or new algorithms to to use it. And therefore, we have like small storage in there that's uh, storing the video. And like we, the, the main challenge is bees are moving fast. Like they. From my understanding, they can walk faster than they can fly, uh, which makes it very difficult for us. And um, like last year, we or by the beginning of this year, we we decided to start using Balena and moving on switching to the Jetson Nano. And therefore, we needed to we wanted to use the same field of view because our training data and everything we collected was based on the Raspberry Pi. And the driver for our camera that we that we that we used, so that we use the Raspberry Pi camera, and the driver on the Jetson Nano um, had some weird quirks. So it didn't support all the resolutions that uh, the, the Jets at uh, the Raspberry Pi supported. Therefore, we need to modify the kernel or the driver itself, and we published some of it on on on, on GitHub. And we needed to could crank it up. I think by the the resolution is six. Uh, 1640 by something up to uh, 40 fps so that we can see every bee that's moving through the image even oh. though it only spends maybe like a fourth of the second in our field of view we still wow. have fun. and i know and that that work that you're referring to um is open source i'm going to drop the link in to chat as well so folks can check that out because i know that you published that to GitHub. Let me see if I can share it. Uh, oh, I, sadly, I can't switch. Um, but yeah, check please. Uh, so I'm really, really happy if others will, will use it. We have a guide like how we can support custom resolutions. So mm -hmm. like all guide how to work with with the with the Raspberry Pi camera because the cool thing is like I saw on Hacker Day some posts where you can just use a free, few lines and can get up to like a lot of hundreds of, of frames per second, wow. and uh, just like you can do a lot of it, and we're really happy that some of the people from from uh, from the Raspberry Pi community published the data sheet of the camera because the Sony chip isn't like open source. It was hard to get our get get your hands on, but uh, really happy that they published it. And um, especially with like this guide, you can like just change it, build it into the um, the Yocto project. So changing the the camera driver of of the Balina image and so on. And we try to describe everything there. And if you have questions, just email the email that's on the bottom, or like write me on Twitter or whatever, and we can help <laughs> you. Right on. That's awesome. Yeah, I put the link to the repo in there. So if anyone does give that a try, um, certainly let us know, let Frederick know. Um, but that's super cool work that you guys did and then open sourced. Um, 
And I have then, a question about distance. Oh, I'm really curious. I mean, you're you're saying earlier, and forgive me if, if I got the numbers wrong, it's anywhere from 60 or more different remote hives that you're monitoring with devices. What's what what's the furthest distance that you're covering? I know you mentioned the 20 kilometer microwave point to point, but like I'm sure that creates the network that will need to hit a hive even further out than that, right? Yeah, so the 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 furthest hive is still in Germany, but in the in the border to Switzerland. So I don't know how far it, it's away, but it's like a three hour drive by car. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. And like we're really happy, like we tried a lot of other things with uh, using Balena. The cool thing is like you have this this the stable OS that's that's running on there with support for the mobile connection and it's it's running smoothly and we can write shitty code that just stops working and we can start connecting the device, update it, and we don't need to to drive like three hours to change yeah. the the, uh, change the software or just oh, yeah. over stuff. over the air baby. <laughs> over the <laughs> air. We do it all day long. Yeah. Write some crappy code and then realize wait a minute. I need to push an update, and sure enough, well, well let's be right fair. Over the air. We scale; we're highly scalable too. You be crappy code yeah. or really well-written code. We, we yeah, all, yeah, we hit everything in between. Yeah, yeah. Well, I should say I should only speak for myself. It's my code that is usually crappy that needs oh, to be. Updated. I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the club too. Oh, you're in the club, yeah, okay. for sure. That's right. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is actually super cool. So in that case. Thinking about that from a scalability perspective, what you have set up there, Frederick, you can deploy, okay, at the furthest right now, I mean, call it a three hour drive, I don't know, 100, 150 kilometers, I give or take, whatever. Um, is there any, other, I mean, could you, you could continue to go further, couldn't you? There's really yes, nothing from, preventing from you. just need to send it somewhere and it needs to be mounted there. Um, Regulation is another big challenge when like moving to, to other like regions. We know how the rules are in Germany and how it's working there, but going to other places, it's um, we like need to be careful about all of this. Um, but basically from like a software and hardware standpoint, for sure. Okay, uh, hardware so hacker Phil has a nice garden. We should volunteer him. That's what I was just gonna say. So I have to wonder now, I understand, of course, local regulation being uh, it being a concern, but you, from your perspective, if you were to send, let's say, the Jetson Nano, the enclosure, the camera, the, the complete, the unit itself, it in and of itself is a piece of hardware that would be placed onto the entrance of the hive. Would you be able to ship just the hardware entrance component? Is that possible then, perhaps? So what yeah so what we, we are doing or what I mentioned before is we think of our uh, of these more as a biosensor, and what we want to do is we want to do like something with the information and building like studies or something else around it where we can actually extract knowledge that's helpful for a lot of people and if there's especially like what would you like for example with the project right now in Karlsruhe. We have the whole city that we're observing. We're working together with the authorities in order to figure out like what they need to change in order to improve, uh, improve, improve the health or the the biodiversity in the environment. And with the other thing, with when we evaluate um, like signal factors that are changing, for example, with pesticides, it's something where we work closely with them and just use the data. And um, so that's our main focus to figure out like doing not only like one single deployment, but see like on a wider range, what's the impact and uh, collecting knowledge. So like, that's a cool thing. Like we can, I it mean, it's hard, sometimes a lot of work to do, to build the hardware and uh, so on. But if it's built and just shipped somewhere, it's it starts working. We can update it. That's that's well done. Cool. Well that's done. Very neat. Yeah, wow. Um, and then, you know, from a scalability perspective, you're really not limited what you've got 60 of them. I mean, you could go to 70, you could go to 80, you could go to 180. I don't think it would have much impact really on your operations, would it? You would just be simply collecting more data, but there's nothing preventing you from, from growing, is there? Yeah. So, um, like we have, our infrastructure is built for, uh, like from within Kubernetes and a lot of stuff that, that could scale and replicate and deal with, with bigger workloads, workloads. 
and beginning or like in the end of last year during holiday season we we try to out and see like what's not what not what's the limit but like could we actually survive this year and we we decided to have like just 64 jets and nanos and see if, if everything scales and we were thinking like on a way like how to mount it and we just built like a christmas tree around and built like every every uh, jets and put it on there and it was a lot of cabling a lot of work uh, and a lot of fun uh, let's see we have on the github like all the sheets like how you can mill it yourself nice. but if you look closely hopefully there's like the or can make it smaller uh, like doing so cool. the cabling is uh, is oh. fun it seems like we've zoomed out quite a bit. There you go. There so, it is. So this is a tree that bees love. I know a guy who's probably made a Christmas tree that bees dislike greatly. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever uh, seen a, the LED Christmas tree project on Bolano, I think it's super yeah. bright. Definitely our, not saving the bees. Our Christmas tree project is not very bee friendly. No, insanely um, festive though. Yeah, Sorry, very, very festive for sure. Um, yeah. It's probably consuming less less power than ours. So we should <laughs> be using like 300 yeah. amps, five volts. Uh, yeah. I remember I think seeing this. Isolate, like have some some stock footage, footage so some some canned footage, uh, some footage of bees from the last year, and just see like what is the heat? How is it developing? How is it changing? Like, can we actually update it? And like a lot of these questions that we had around it, we just tried it out, and it was a lot of fun. Nice uh, work. Yeah. yeah, cabling was was hard. Like, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. Are there any plans to modify it or improve it for this holiday season? Yeah, I mean, Christmas is right around the corner. You better get started. Yeah, we need to get we need to get a partner that helps us just to get the hardware because right now everything is next to the beehives and we we want to keep it this way. Um, nice. But maybe like if we're someone who maybe lends us like what's two hundred fifty six or whatever, like how far we want to move. Would be fun, okay, funny so project. There's the call out. Who's going to donate 256 Jets and Nanos? Frederick mm. is willing to give them a good home. <laughs> Why do you keep plugging local the bees. local high school bees? <laughs> bees. <laughs> Every time I see it, I want it's it's like some SNL like the Bears reference. <laughs> um, that's that's super cool. Um, so like, last thing, last thing I, I wanted to, to show you like what like what we want to do in the future is um, so we have another data set on bees that we release and that's on wow. host detection so like wow. putting a skeleton onto bees and that's that's as more like the research part like we did like a we written a paper on it and it's all linked in the repository and the cool thing is like if you have like a skeleton of bees you can see like how it's moving how it's sh maybe shaking or something else and that gets us more into like the behavior changes and more the research side and so on and we are really happy if like other people want to try it out and do some do something with this and um one other like cool side like benefit is that we not only doing like a lot of papers with scientific communities about like doing post detection on humans uh but this might might have like um, some some can be used in the wrong way or in like uh, not not the intended way and like moving to bees is like still uh, it helps us better to understand bees how what's our impact on the bees is and so on so cool cool for for computer vision people to try it out mm, that's super cool although MCA for bees uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, we had um, Jason from Always A on a few weeks back do some pose detection, uh, but that was human based, not bee based. Now, so and I have to very wonder, disco related. He's going to have to get himself a beehive in order to test yes, this out, though, right? Yeah, you can train this algorithm with our data and just deploy it next to a beehive and see. Mm. Uh, you can detect, or maybe like, just use a different animal, like fruit flies or something. Very right cool, on. like cool, cool projects on, on fruit flies. Okay. Mm, we'll have to ping him on that and yeah, get him a, get really him a beehive over there. Um, yeah, so that's so that's neat. So that comes back around full circle to the if someone is in fact able to deploy um, again, not knowing regulations, but deploy uh, one of your setups to one of their local beehives. Yeah, they could actually um, run this as well. Then, neat. yeah. So our our approach is more like the cool. We do like kind of a hybrid approach. 
So some stuff that we can do locally, we do locally, and then we use the mobile data to upload other parts that we that just just is a really um, yeah a filtered version of of the stuff, and we can do additional computation on it, like detecting poses or like classifying classifying if something is a queen or not, um, and all this this stuff that might be helpful. How can you tell but if it's a queen? Data. That's that's challenging. It's a lot of data. Yeah. How can you tell if it's a queen? Oh, a I queen is like a bee queen and, and bumblebee queens too are larger. Like they are they are like, larger. Like three X, right? Like they're yeah. huge. I'm not sure if it's like yeah, maybe, maybe two yeah, two to a female worker bee probably yes. Wow. And you see a lot of drones, uh, like the male drones and um, they they always look kind of stupid. It's really really funny to <laughs> Just like in real life. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, them pheromones, you know. Yeah. Well, is there? I want to be cognizant of the time. We're approaching the top of the hour. I know folks will have to drop off and get back to what they're up to. Um, is there anything else, Frederick? You want to sneak in any other? Any other items you want to cover? Oh, I'm, I'm just like if, if someone is, is uh, has some ideas how to how to or wants to try something on their own, and we are really happy to release some data and just share it with others and work on not on us, uh, work on our uh, algorithms to improve it and incorporate other ideas. So um, just shoot us an email or met, like on our website, there's more information. Uh, really happy to to collaborate. Do you? Um... You talked about writing papers. Are you working with other researchers at universities, either where you are or around the world? I, I, in a past life, I worked at Cornell, and I know that there was a lot of data um, of this kind being shared to do exactly what you were just talking about. Yeah, so we have, like, for example, the post detection I, I sh showed earlier was mo it's like more on the research side, and that's what was created with the collaboration with university that um, where I'm still studying <laughs> and like other people who, still, who were, were working day and we written the paper with the KIT so the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and we're working with other uh, like some other universities and research centers and moreover for example one strong partner of ours it's called uh, Eurofins Eurofins and they have like they are like a, a kind of contract lab for for uh, acro science or like uh, like this this stuff and they a lot of people with PhDs with a lot of knowledge on bees and everything else are there. I'm really happy to work with them. They're really yeah, cool. I can imagine. Yeah, it's a, a leap forward in, in kind of data that they haven't had at their fingertips before. Yeah, and we've been writing like the, the study I showed earlier. Like we, 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 I think by now we've written like papers with three peer peer reports on uh, about it, and they are. They're published and they should be somewhere on our website or we'll share it later. Um, yeah. It's really fascinating. Very cool. Well, any other questions? Let me check real quick over in the YouTube chat. I didn't see any others roll in. Um, anything else from you guys? Mark, John, Andrew, any other last questions or otherwise? We'll um, let Frederick go back to tending to the bees. Wow, this is amazing. Yeah, I'm just yeah. blown away. I mean, it the is, amount of work that you have just shown in the past one hour is just absolutely incredible. I will give a shameless plug. If you're mm -hmm. in an area that you know has programs around creating a more, you know, enjoyable habitat for bees. Uh, I definitely consider uh, encourage you to partake in that. It's really easy. It's like for us here in Oregon, in the United States, we live we live outside of Portland. It's it's really just plant n number of of types of fl uh, flowers uh, and and plants, uh, and it helps tremendously. Like we've noticed, at least in our community, that there are, there's a, a resurgence. You know, and and you know we're one small community, but if if a bunch of places around the state, the country, the world keep doing it, you know, we can we can. Yeah, help help the little guys, help, help the little critters out. Yeah, and and end up helping ourselves for sure. I love the almonds. Thing is if you like, you can just write like there are probably a lot of local beekeepers club around there. And if you ask them, for example, what should I like? If you have no idea how to so far to uh, like what to plant, 
just ask them. They they know their bees. They know when they bring in food and when there's a lack of food, just by their experience, and they will will guide you like to something that you could do that actually has impact and improves the the life of all pollinating insects around you. Can A13 <laughs> Tech visit you someday? Looks like they're <laughs> nearby. You can write me on, 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 on Twitter and we can move it forward from there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. There's the Twitter handle right there cool. for everyone. Yep. All right. Well, um, I think. So cool. Yeah, I'm I'm still well just done, in awe. I'm just in shock. Thank you, Frederick, for uh, you and your crew join us. Yeah, and the rest of the team yeah. as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Like we, have, I think we're right now like twelve people, and like all most of the work wow. is done. Like all the, the team is like very very cool people who have like a very good understanding about a lot of topics like computer vision and so on, and like they they doing like all of the work, and it's like really cool to um, to have them with us oh. on this journey. Awesome. Please wow. come, please come back later when you do the uh, the Christmas tree, the bee yeah. saving tree. Get the love to get have the you back. Get the Christmas tree project queued up. We'll have you back for sure. We'll get ours queued up too. Yeah. <laughs> ours is ours we is not our group is faster. <laughs> uh, we well, can have one, a thing, one thing I want to show you, like if someone Ooh. has oh, right here, yeah. one more thing. Go for it. Uh -oh. No, go for it. You're uh, good. An encore, absolutely. He's going to the hive. <laughs> He's going to come back stung. Hey. Hey, that's not technical difficulties. Yeah. No way. No way. Let's see what he comes back with. The suspense is killing me. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. There's not bees in there. I'm going to. Yeah. As I mentioned before, like last year, we used Raspberry Pis. And we have like a bunch of them. And we have oh. no idea what we should do with them. Any ideas? OK. Oh, wow. How oh, many are in there? Maybe more. More hives. <laughs> oh wait, no. You need a. You need a. We need more computation power. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a good yeah. question. That's a you good know, question. Local schools would be a good option too. Yeah, you we, know? Yeah. We, we we shared with some of them, like like them, but um, maybe like other op other ideas too. Or if we've there's got a no around it. Uh, feel free to to mess with me. We've got we a really to... cool Wi-Fi repeater project that we were just talking about in in one of our brainstorm sessions about you know if a lot of schools need Wi-Fi coverage and they don't want people to be near students to be near each other or, or observe social distancing and I'm speaking mm -hmm. from a very American centric perspective right now yep. extend the Wi-Fi network right because then everybody can yep. be far apart doing their remote courses if you don't have access to strong internet connectivity you can go to a community center that does and perhaps that community center can repeat the signal out in the parking lot. Um, I know that that's been on my mind as of late. So when I see a pile of pies, yeah, like that, those kind of pies. If I see a pile of other kind of pies, you know, that's, that's <laughs> the Kubernetes. Cluster. Yeah, uh, there you go, uh, yeah. Matthew, Matthew. Solid yeah, Kubernetes cluster, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you need, the other you, you need to have a, a strong Wi-Fi because, like, the challenge is like we have the what's called like it's a D8 plus, right? Um, uh, like without Ethernet, that's that's the, the challenge. But maybe hmm. like. A, Good Wi-Fi router that can handle it. Yeah. Actually, we can do here. Um, yeah, I mean, I can think of perhaps maybe, you know, if you can find some local organizations that do the um, STEM for the younger kids, you know, introducing them to their first computer, those kinds Very of programs, cool. you know, the uh, coding for kids types of programs that exist. <laughs> David, we should send out kits to kids and invite, like, them and their parents on one of these episodes and just like live build something together with the kiddos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be legit. Yeah, that would be. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we need to find some children. <laughs> um, but there's right. like a lot, lot of these organizations like uh, like mentioned like uh, coding for kids or something like this. They're um they're pretty cool what they're doing. Elena summer camp. Yeah. yeah. There are some there are some neat That's a good idea. Out there. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, uh, let me do one last quick sweep for any questions. I do not see any that have rolled in. So I think we can, uh, I think we can probably call it there. Thanks again right for on. watching everyone in the audience and thank you for joining us. Definitely appreciate you taking the time out of your day, Frederick. Um, super interesting. And, uh, uh, just keep us posted on all your developments. Love to have you back. Thanks. Nice to be here. I'm really happy to share our story. Yeah, fantastic. Nice work. Cool. Very nice work. Right.
<laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yep. Take it easy. Bye. Bye, guys.